up in the morning beneath the stars so bright. Pull your hat down, make sure your cinch is tight. Horse is kind of snuffy, cold chill up your spine. You'll get your ass moving somewhere burning daylight. Welcome to Burning Daylight, the only podcast for the working cowboy. Well, howdy there, Daylight Burners. Welcome back. Sorry I missed a little episode earlier this week, but I think we got a good one to make up for. We got Tommy Gazelle uh, here. He's a, you're a Texas fella originally living in South Carolina, low country now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Close to Charleston. Okay. Uh, my wife and I went to Charleston for our honeymoon. I am, I'm very fond of that place. I'm, I'm not big, it, not fond of cities much, but that's a pretty cool city. It is, and and that's where I met my lovely wife. Nice, nice. That's uh, yeah. Like I said, I we had a good time. The food's excellent out there. Oh uh, yeah. I I don't know what the southern thing is with grits. I, I've never really understood that. But if you throw some shrimp and peppers and stuff in there, it, it ain't bad. I'll I'll eat that. <laughs> yeah, the, the shrimp and grits is pretty famous around here. <laughs> yeah, I've never been a grits guy, but uh, but the sh- you you throw some shrimp in there, and that's pretty dang tasty. We always, <laughs> um we had to we had to go full tourist when we were there and went to Justine's kitchen and and had the fried chicken and uh, I forget what they call the sweet but man yeah that's supposed to be the best fried chicken around too <laughs> yeah oh uh, oh uh i guess, i think it was guy fieri that went there he he knew what he was doing on that one it was it oh, was right. it was damn good um but neat neat place not exactly what you'd uh you'd expect a, a horse trainer uh you know to, to be located um but i i guess uh the thing about back east there are still people that have plenty of horses they're just they don't use them like we do out here. Yeah, and um, there, there's a don't you know? Don't get me wrong. There's a ton of horses out here, and um, you know, it's kind of there. And and there's not a whole lot of what I would say, you know, cult starters, and 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 there's some good horsemen around. Um, a different style, of course, but horses to me out here are a luxury as opposed to horses out west are a necessity. Mm. Um, you know, people are using them much, you know, much more out west for work. And, you know, around here, it, it's showing. And um, that could be hunter jumpers, um, could be fox hunting, um, polo. And, yeah. you know, I, wouldn't, I don't think any of those are necessarily a necessity, mm-hmm. but they're definitely a luxury. Yeah, that's that's for sure. Like we were talking earlier today, my, uh, my oldest sister... Um, she's this is her third marriage so she was she's paula mckinley uh paula duhan or paula williams depending on when you caught her but now she goes by williams but she uh she was pretty she uh she was actually coaching at um unc greensboro i think it's got a maybe got an equestrian team or something they do Um, they do yeah so she was she was coaching there for a little while and then she uh she had her own kind of barn circuit that she went and uh and now i think she's kind of kind of like you've got where she's just under private contract now but um <clears throat> yeah and and she she said the same thing it's uh it's a different horse world back there there's still a lot of horses but it's a it's a completely it's a little more uh well it's a high-end mentality not necessarily high-end horses but a high-end mentality yeah and you you know you come across a lot of warm bloods um which you know are neat in their own way um i had one at one time he he was wonderful fox hunter and he jumped all right and uh but i've broke or started a lot of warm bloods um and there you know goofy deals uh how, how was that when one of them busts into well, you know, they're almost too big to keep going. <laughs> they wear themselves <laughs> out pretty quick. And and I can't recall, oh, 
I don't think I've ever had a bad warm blood to start. Um, but the one thing is, is just like a well-bred quarter horse, their movement just comes naturally. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's, what's neat about them is, is just their movement. And even, you know, different from quarter horse thoroughbred yeah. and, um, their big movements. And, you know, I will say that the warm bloods have taught me finesse and the art of what a, a refined horse should feel like. And that's just being a 30 day baby, you know, under saddle compared mm -hmm. to, you know, the, some of these gangly thoroughbreds that, you know, it take a little bit to get through to them. Um, the warm bloods, there's a re now I don't want to insult anybody, but there's a reason they call them dumb bloods. Uh, <laughs> we can yeah, insult they, everybody here. We're it's a, it's it's listed a comedy podcast for a reason. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they um they they're pretty. I don't want to say dull minded, but they're not going to put up much of a challenge. And kind of, uh, kind they're of a pretty deadhead. easy. They're yeah. They're, well, yeah, they're pretty easy to convince. Let's put it that yeah, way. Uh, there you you go. put it an obstacle in front of them. They're gonna. They'd rather not fight you and wear themselves out, and they'll just do do what you asked. You know well, that that's got to be pretty handy at times, though. It is, and and that's the way I, I approach all my horses too. No matter if it's a warm blood or quarter horse, thoroughbred. When I'm starting the young horse, is just. Um, I I think I hit on this today at some point. Is ride them like they're made, mm. and don't ever doubt them. And I don't care if it's the first ride or the the. 30th ride you got on them just don't doubt them and i approach you know if i get on a two-year-old for his first ride and he feels all right in the round crowd then i'm going to take him out there's no no sense of me keeping him in the round crowd let's 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 expose him as quick as we can yeah. and if i'm taking him out in the woods and um I, I can recall one horse i had and his first ride i took out well, I mean, he's a fairly good sized down tree in front of me. And I just looked at it as, Hey, confidence builder and yeah. took him, trotted him up to it and no hesitation. And I just put a little leg on and put my hands forward and just gave him support he needed. And over he went. And after that, it was just piece of cake to him. Um, huh. But that's just the way I, I, I kind of go after my young horses is just um, treat them like they're, you know, ride them like they're made and um don't doubt them and also that not just as a horseman but if there's there's people out there that are riding with the aspirations of becoming a trainer is is when you start to ride like that and approach your young horses as made horses you start to develop a confidence in yourself mm -hmm. and that's to me, the confidence in yourself is 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 key to working with almost any horse in any discipline. You've got to have the confidence, and um, it, it's taken a while for me to to realize that, and also to have that confidence in myself to where I'm comfortable with what I do, and I do all kinds of stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not just one thing, you know, and and um, you know the contract I'm under right now, we're, we're always doing, getting into different things every other year, different horses. And, um, that, that's what I really enjoy, but I'm at a point now where I'm into the stage of not so much, you know, I've got a couple green horses and, and I got one that I said, I like to keep him green cause he's so fun to train. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've got a handful of horses that are really letting me get into the part of finishing one. And, you know, when I was a colt breaker and I was young and that's all I was doing was breaking babies, you never really get a chance to finish one or to put a refinement no. handle on them. And now in the past couple of years, few years, I've had that opportunity to really focus on you know, finishing one, putting that refinement, that, that nice soft touch on one. And, and that, that could be anywhere from, from, you know, putting them in, you know, bridle, you know, just create, you know, making a bridle horse. And to me, a bridle horse is, is, is just as fun as riding, 
a two-year-old that's a little snorty for the first time. I get a mm. joy out of both of it. Um, oh, yeah. Well, it's the same know. thing like on a real, real well-bred, well-trained cutter, you know, when you drop the reins and that sucker, like, yeah, you hold on. because <laughs> he, He's just going to go. And uh, and that's that's really fun. Or, you know, when when you when you get a good rope horse that just just works the rope just like you want them, you know, and uh, yeah. and just moves off the legs and uh, and, you know, it just that, that's that's yeah, like you said, it's just as big of a thrill. I'll be with a with a way less danger profile than, than a snorty <laughs> two year old, but it's uh, it's still just as fun. You get that same kind of rush and uh, and it's just it's just really cool, especially if like you it's something that you've been working on. And you're just like, fuck, yeah, yeah. fuck, it, yeah, it, that. Yeah, it, it, it gets to a point where, it, you know, like I say, satisfaction is short lived in this industry and in training horses because it's you know the other day my buckskin horse um i i have no other way to describe him but he was just at the stage he's at and what i what i was asking of him he was perfect mm -hmm. i mean it, it was it, it, one of the best rides i had on that horse and he um was in a bridle that i've only ridden him in that was the second time i'd ridden him in the certain bridle and uh the sam marsh pelham and i mean the horse was just precise little bitty movements and and mm -hmm. it's funny you know you compare like you said when you drop the reins on a cutting horse and they go to work there's you know just that that pure excitement that joy that feeling well you know i can get that from riding a bucking horse or riding a cutter or getting those little precise movements mm -hmm. out of my horse yeah if i want him to move his left foot three quarters of an inch to the you know, to the left, he's going to do it. Mm -hmm. And, but like today he's a shithead. Yeah. You know, it, it's that's horses. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like here, uh, like I was telling you today, so we, we've had in the last week and a half, we've had mm, a good close to 20 inches of snow, uh, probably close to two inches of rain. I don't, I didn't see what the, the gauge said it, today but it was i mean it was just dumping buckets when i went went into this morning and uh so we're we're at you know foot of just liquid shit everywhere <laughs> and 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 it's and it's cold enough to where like today it didn't uh you know it was raining when i got up so it wasn't froze and uh but it's still cold enough to where it's just thick and soupy it's uh just a good just that right consistency to pull all the muscles you know <laughs> and, and pull uh, your boots off and pull your yeah. horse's shoes off mm -hmm. and... <laughs> I, I tell you i i uh i walked a uh, uh heifer down the alley the other day from the shoot she was just i didn't i didn't feel like going back and getting the horse because it was just down the you know a couple pins over from the mm -hmm. shoot and uh man if i had to do that very often i'd have an ass like that laney wilson gal you know just oh I mean, is that the singer a... yeah isn't that thing a work of art <laughs> i still haven't figured out what this whole thing is <laughs> it's uh well I, we can pull it up that's the cool thing about, about this little platform is you're we, gonna we force can, me to look at this huh and make a judgment you you can uh you can tell your old lady this this was completely my fault because i sent this to my to my wife and i said hey is this real or is this like work done and uh, that's what i'm trying to figure out if it that's real. <laughs> um, I've I've decided that it's probably as real as Sasquatch, and I believe in Sasquatch. So, uh, <laughs> that that's that's what I'm going with. Um, well, <laughs> but that thing is uh, I don't know what's going on. Well, I'm just well I will it. say it looks like my horse Big Pete's butt. Yeah, it's I, it's. I'm gonna have a bunch of Laney Wilson horses running around come springtime after this <laughs> after this winter. <laughs> oh no, no! Dump the whiskey already. Hold on, technical difficulties. <laughs> we we get to talking about big butts and I go go to hell, go to hell in a handbasket. 
Um, well, I will say that that I like my horses with big butts and big hips on them. Me too. Me too. You know? I uh, I like a, a yeah, just a good good solid hip on the yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there, there's there's nothing nothing wrong with that. There we go. We we got it. I think I think we got it pulled up now. Maybe. There we go. All right. Pop it up here. Just, and this is just for science sake here. I, I probably wasn't what you were expecting to get into on <laughs> on this podcast, but hey, we're here. We're here oh, now. Oh God. What is that? It is uh yeah, I, I, I think according to my wife, that thing is real. And you know, I don't know if she's got a guy or whatever, but good for him if uh if she does. Um yeah, that's you know, they they can never again say that that white girls don't have butts, because that that thing is yeah, yeah. I, I wish all my horses had, had butts like that. You know, I do too. I, I wish they all did, but um, yeah. That I don't. Yeah, I forget who who sent that to me, and now like it seems like every third post on Instagram is just something about Laney Wilson's butt, and I'm not I'm not upset by it, <laughs> but, but my wife goes like. Is that all you look at? I'm like, well, it kind of is now, but it's not my fault. I promise. Well, it's kind of all they're showing. I don't even know what her face looks like. It, I'm, you know, scrolling through social media, and that thing pops up, and I'm like, what in the hell? And yeah. I just, I don't, I don't know if it's a meme or what it was when I first saw it, <laughs> but I, I didn't know, keep I, up with it. It was, uh, I guess, it was during NFR when when somebody they either shared it. And and I it came across or, or I I think somebody sent it to me though, and like I said I'm not I'm not upset by it, but it it has like overtaken my my news feed here lately, and like I said I'm not I'm not upset by it, but it, it's it uh it did make me wonder is like, you know it seems like nowadays everything is is just kind of is that is that all natural or, or is that you know we got some supplements involved there <laughs> yeah definitely got some weight builder in there yeah exactly yeah probably on senior feed you know that <laughs> <laughs> three times a day <laughs> three times a day yeah a couple, couple extra cans if uh if uh depending on how how you feel but uh um so i guess uh before we get too fo- too much farther in this, uh, what, what's uh, what's your background a little bit? I know you're 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 from Texas, and um, I, I've seen seen your stuff around here and there on on uh, on Facebook. And being in the the cowboy and kind of horseman world, it's uh, you know it's there's a lot of people in it, but it's still kind of a kind of a small community. So um, it, it is. I agree with you hundred percent on that. And um, social media to me has made it, made it much smaller, but I met a lot of great people, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I grew up in, in South Texas and um, a triplet uh, twin brother, twin sister. Oh, and no um, uh, mom showed horses. And so, you know, there were horses always around and it always seemed that I was getting hurt by him every time (laughs) just being you know mom you know that's the way mom taught us is you know i don't want to say she ever gave us a formal lesson she just gave us life lessons and and um but it oh this wasn't my plan i i i when i was a kid i dreamed of being a professional surfer if that imagine that because (laughs) hell the horses were hurting me all the time and um but um I think I think the thing that really struck a spark in me that there might be something something to this is is I watched the it was an old polo documentary I believe called the um, Palo Alto Project and okay and from the first minute that video came on um, I, something 
went off in me and I didn't know quite what it was. And, and so I, after high school, I mean, we, you know, we started riding a little bit more and a little bit more here and there and, and carrying the polo mallet with us and, and didn't know what the hell we were doing. And, you know, I'm trying to hit a polo ball off a 16 two thoroughbred and, um, but you know, I didn't think anything of it leading to any type of future. And so I stuck around Texas for a little bit after high school and, and, um, uh Oh, did I lose you? Oh, no, I'm still here. Uh -oh. Okay. Yeah. So I, after high school, I stuck around and, and worked at stockyards and rodeoed a little bit. Well, yeah, I'll just say a little bit. I started out riding saddle Bronx and then went to, um, uh, riding bareback horses or wait a minute. Yeah. And then, um, broke my arm riding bareback horses. And so I started riding bulls and did that for a while. And, and then had a chance to, um, move to Wyoming and work at a ranch out there with my brother and, um, this ranch that, you know, they bred pole ponies. That, that's what they did. And so I thought, well, hell, this is cool. And, but I was just going up there to visit and, um, mm -hmm. hang out with my brother for a little bit. And, and, um, what was, uh, was there a guy, there was a guy that, um, when I was in Kansas, uh, cause I'm originally from Southeast Colorado mm -hmm. and, and I was living there in, in Southwest Kansas and there was a fella, I had posted an ad, uh, I was trying to sell a, my, my good mare actually, I still got her, um, on ranch world ads. And uh, I forget the guy's name, Bill Bill Mackey, maybe. And he was he was wanting to buy her as a polo horse. And I wonder if maybe as I, I forget where yeah. he's from Wyoming somewhere. Well, Bill Mackey, he's he's got a he goes to Wyoming, and then he's also in Alabama. Yes, yes, is where he's at. And and, and he he um actually I talked to him. I think it was in September. Um, I talked to him a little bit, and I forgot what it was about but you know i know he's he's buying and selling a lot of polo ponies yeah and, yeah he um, uh he was kind of a trader and i don't say that in uh in a disparaging way he just he was you know sometimes that that horse trader kind of has a negative connotation and i i don't i don't mean to say that with him he seemed like a pretty straight up guy no it, it there, you like know, he traded a lot of horses. Th there's people out there, and and I still can't figure out this formula how they do it. That there is a people out there that just sell a ton of horses, mm -hmm. and they put little time into them, and they make good money off of them, and they're good horses. Mm -hmm. And and so there, you know, I think the the name or saying horse trader is. Yeah, like you said, it's got a, a, kind of a derogatory meaning to it, but not in a, it doesn't have to. Right. Um, I mean, hell, if if I can make a living buying horses and putting 30 days on them and making them a good solid horse and making decent money, hell, I do I I do it. <laughs> well, and you know, they they got to be good uh at some point because otherwise your your you know, your client base dries up pretty quick. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and especially in the horse world, uh, word of mouth is a killer. Oh yeah. Um, word, word of mouth is everything. Yeah. And, and, and you, and to me, you've got to admit your mistakes and it, um, and stay humble in this business. And, and, you know, when, when I was in Wyoming with my brother back, God, this is late nineties. Um, we're, we're going to one other part of the ranch to um i think look at the brood mares and the man we were with he was he was head of the 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 horse division at the flying h mm -hmm. um he said he just asked me he said have you ever rode bronx before and i said well yeah i, I, I rodeoed and he said no i mean talking about just you know break he didn't say breaking colts he just said can you ride a bucking horse and i said yeah, yeah. and um he said you want a job and i said well yeah, I want a job. Mm -hmm. And so I tore up my plane ticket, called mom and said, I'm staying. I'm me and Jerry are going to, well, you know, I'm going to be working with Jerry and, and they got all these, all these two-year-olds everywhere and three-year-olds. And, 
and it was like heaven. And, and so I got to work with a, 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 a really, I don't like to drop names. I, I, I just, I try not to be a name dropper. And, uh, but I worked with a man that, that was a big influence on me when I was younger and mm -hmm. learned some things from him and then just kind of started, you know, of course, working with my brother and working under the guidance of some other uh, other people. Um, but it, we're, you know, the 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 thing at this ranch was, you know, we're we're halter breaking weanlings, mm -hmm. we're saddle breaking yearlings, we're you know saddle breaking two year olds and riding them and. And when I'm talking riding them, we're, you know, we're putting them on cattle and, and we're riding them all day long. And mm. we got, you know, I think at one time we had 14, 15 of them and, and it was a blast. And then as a three-year-old or, or a late two during branding season, we're using these horses. We started from the ground up and we're dragging calves in the branding pen. And I know mm. it's a lot of people do that, but when I'm, I think I was 21 years old, you know, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. You know, That's I get the best to, job ever. I get to ride these, these two year olds. And if they get to, if they buck and you know, yay, I, I don't mind riding a bucking horse. I like riding mm -hmm. bucking horses and you know, I get to, to, to move cattle every now and then that wasn't our main job. There was not the cattle was just strictly the horses, but we got to use our two year olds on, you know, moving these cattle. And then by the time they're three, I get to put them on the polo field. And, yeah. and that was, that was just one of the coolest things to me. And, um, and then as a four year old, you spend one more summer on them and then they go to Florida or Tennessee or, you know, or the cell barn, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, that always happens. But I was kind of getting, all of these different disciplines at one time at one ranch and it was teaching me just horsemanship nonstop and i didn't even realize it i was so young at that time and of course when you're that young and you're in bighorn wyoming and you're around polo you kind of don't think about all that stuff you kind of think mm -hmm. about having fun and oh yeah we, 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 we did a lot of that. And, you know, I will say it took a lot of maturing from that point. You know, I went back to Texas um, after a couple winters and went back to my real job selling um, basically all the medicine that goes to a feedlot I was selling mm -hmm. and um, breaking colts here and there on the side at mom's place. And, and, but I couldn't stand it. I just couldn't take it anymore. And, and I had an opportunity to move to Aiken, South Carolina, and that's where Jerry was at the time. Mm -hmm. And there was actually a product I was selling at um, VA Snails that was made right outside of Aiken. And so I did a job interview, got up here, they hired me. And so I moved up here and I, of course i knew that job wasn't gonna last <laughs> and and i i needed to ride horses i wanted to ride horses and and when you're in aiken south carolina that's all there is to do i mean there's mm -hmm. every type of horse you could think of except well there wasn't any roping horses in aiken at that time there's a couple now but mm. um you know is is the only job i could find riding horses at that time was on the racetrack and really? yeah and it's you know i i went up to the barn and i talked to the trainer and she said you know i said do you have a job and she said well what do you want to, what, what do you do and i said i break babies and she said okay how do you do it and i said well i take them in the round corral i hobble them this and that and she's like no this is a race barn we don't do that i said what do mm -hmm. you mean and she says we put you on their back and i'm like and she's then she says we put you on the track and then you go and mm. you know i as much as i did not i will say that was the one thing that growing up in this industry i did not like was riding racehorses yeah i just it, it, it 
a, a racehorse trainer is very specific to me, a racehorse. That's yeah. all they want is a horse that runs. And, but in that process, I met another man that ran, that raised racehorses, but he didn't do it on the track. He kept them at his farm. And when I went over there to talk to him, he had 10 of them to break. Um, I said, well, Marshall, why are they not on the track? He says, because out of these nine horses, 10, one of them's going to make it. So I need to be able to sell the other ones. And the first thing that those ones for sale need to do is learn how to stop. Mm. And that's one thing racehorses off the track don't do very well. No. And so this guy wanted me to put a stop on them. Wanted me to put a little bit, I don't want to say put a little bit of a handle on them, but put a little bit of um, maneuverability, I guess you could say yeah. with these horses. And then from there, business just started growing and growing and growing. And not only that, but my horsemanship. And, and, and I was just, you know, like like I told you this afternoon, I, I've never really ridden with anybody. I've never trained with anybody. I just listen and watch. Mm -hmm. And I don't watch one particular discipline. And I will say that probably the one discipline that benefited me the most was basic dressage. And I know there's a lot of people that probably are sick of me talk they're they're probably sick of me talking about that by now but to me the you know basic dressage is key to to creating a, uh, the the movement foundation of your horse the manipulation oh, yeah. of the body and um and and it, it's just ba you know dressage means training in french i mean mm. and so when i started to do it i got to be around a lot of three-day eventers at one time and i got to watch three, four lessons a day. And I actually took a couple and I was like, that's it. That's what I'm looking for right there. I don't have to mule rein these babies around the pasture, all, you know, for 30 days. I can actually start getting, getting them to bend their rib cage, getting them to soften, mm -hmm. to supple within that 30 days to where it's just a little bit easier for my client to ride. But also mm -hmm. it was all, I mean, it was just, it, it changed my whole perception on what I was doing. And also really opened my mind to um, to this whole other world that, you know, I didn't see in South Texas. You don't see three day eventers like this. And um, you don't you know, I know there's dressage down there and, and and all of that, but not like when I was around. And it was just a. a, a It was one of those really growing points in my horsemanship is real, you know, and it took somebody to yelling at me to get me to understand what they meant by I could be a better trainer. And that was by going further, advancing my horsemanship, not just breaking babies. Mm -hmm. I can do so much more than just break a baby. And so once I really understood what she was saying, once she quit yelling at me, then it clicked is yeah i could be doing a lot more with these horses than what i'm doing and yeah. then that also evolved my horsemanship as well is it got me in a state of mind is is my horses can always be better i mm -hmm. can always be better and i can take advice i could leave advice but i never discount somebody for their advice um, cause they might have a different approach on, on the way they train horses and, um, and then just from, oh, I guess there came an occasion in 2006 or 2007, I had a man call me about starting a, um, little, little Palomino horse he had bought down here in the low country. And I was still up in Aiken, um, and I, I called the man and, and, and I said, you know, what, what, what do you want me to do with this horse? And he said, well, I want you to get him broke. He's pretty nasty. And I said, well, okay, I can do that. But what are your plans? And at that time he had an idea that maybe he would make 
this horse a rope horse and and i said well, okay cool i you know i can get started doing that you know dragging logs and whatnot and mm-hmm. and just putting a handle on him good enough and i'm still with that man today and that that's the one i'm under contract with now and so if you count back to 2006 how many years is that <laughs> Was that seven, 17 years? I think Close to 17 years I've been with this man and he allowed me to continue. He, we broke Mustangs for him that he was, he was running a Mustang program at the time. And um, so when we got back to South Carolina from Wyoming, he, he had built a, a, a really nice facility down here in the low country. And, I was still working for the public. I was breaking babies like mad. I mean, I, I was, I, I was, I had a waiting list. I couldn't tell you how long. And then I was riding his horses at the same time. And so there was kind of this, I work out of his barn. I ride his horses, but I still get to have my clients. And mm. then um, from there, very interesting. It takes a complete 180. I get introduced to fox hunting. Oh, okay. Mounted fox hunting is something I would have never, never in a million years thought that I would have been doing. And then as that progressed, then the horses changed over. We started going into the warm bloods and the thoroughbreds. And I'm still working for the public at this time. And I decide, you know what? I'm a, I'm adventurous enough. I've got a big enough imagination. I've got an idea. And so I went to him and I said, why don't we start our own? Let's, let's just call it pack of hounds, our own Fox hunt. And he said, okay. And I blew my mind. And so I was now developing Fox hunters and Fox hounds, which is a lot of work. A lot I of work. can imagine. And and not only that, I was I was kind of in charge of all of it. Um, I was given an autonomy to do what I wanted, do what I needed, and get the help I needed to 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 accomplish what we were shooting out for. And and so then we 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 you know that was a great opportunity to really expose horses to what I'm going to call extreme shit. Um, yeah, I'd say so. You know, it, it's, you're not only dealing with, you know, 32 hounds, 16 couple, you know, screaming, you've got sometimes 15 riders, 30 riders, 60 riders riding behind you. And wow. you got to have a horse that's got a good mind for that. And <laughs> that that so, would uh they don't know whether to shit or go blind. <laughs> that it's exactly it. And and but you know, and and the thing too is is I guess I left this out is I've been riding an English saddle for quite some time. Of course, the polo saddle is not an English saddle, but basically same thing. See mm-hmm. and um so you know, ride, ride ride my English saddle or ride my stock saddle. It may you know no difference. They're saddles, um, just the English saddle. You have a little less around you, and you got to keep your you leg on a little bit you steadier. Have a lot more like, balance. Yeah, a lot more balance, and that made me a, a, a to me. That's really what refined my riding was was riding my English saddles and 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 jumping. Like I said, you know that was something when I was in Aiken and I was around these three day eventers and I'm watching them jump these big fences and you know, the, the, the solid jumps. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. It looks like it's, that looks dangerous. I want to do that. Um, yeah. See that's where the cowboy part comes in and just like, (laughs) Oh, that looks really dumb. Let's go do it. (laughs) Let's go do it at a full gallop. And, uh, and so I started, going out to some of these schooling courses with some of my babies and young horses and and 
the people I was with while they're training over these fences, I'm out just messing around out in the, you know, jumping a log into the pond and, and going down banks and up banks and, just doing all of this stuff that these ladies are competing at. I'm just looking at it like, this looks like fun. Mm -hmm. And, and so later on, let's say five, six, seven years ago, I figured I better start taking this shit seriously. If, 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 if if I'm going to do it, there's no half ass to it. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking for, you know, I got a race, race trainer right around the corner and I was buying horses from him and um, I had all the jumps that I needed and ones we didn't have, we had built and I just went to jumping twice a week, all my horses, all of them. Mm. And I don't care if they were a jumping horse or not. Every one of them had to do something over a log, a ditch. And, huh. um, but then my Fox hunters are the ones that I had to get serious on. And, 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 you know, going from cross rails to a four foot triple bar <laughs> is quite an accomplishment. And I say, I was pretty proud and I'll say that, um, you, it's another one of those things. Like when you, you, you drop your reins on a cutting horse and they go right to work, there, there's that sense of accomplishment and that amazing mm -hmm. ability in a horse, but then it's short lived and yeah. it, it's time to go on and make a better one. Yeah. And, um, so now I'm here by way of, well, I don't want to say misfortune. I, I, I needed to make a change and in order to make that change, I had to break my ankle. Mm. And I did that doing a video of a sale horse, a, a horse that, um, Oh, I think it was thoroughbred. And, I didn't like him and we needed to sell him. And so we, we were going to make a sell video and he was jumping around just fine and came to a little brush box and he moved to the left so quick that, that I went straight off his shoulder and, and my left ankle went almost 90 degrees sideways and, Oof. and, um, in the stirrup or no, or I was, it, I landed, I came on the ground straight down like this on the ground mm. and, when that left foot hit the ground, it just went sideways because I was Oof. I was coming down with so much force. Yeah. And so now I got a lot got of time. Slingshotted. It, exactly. Yeah. It flung me. Mm -hmm. And so now I've got a lot of time to think. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? Fox hunting is probably not a good idea because riding alone is dangerous in itself. But fox hunting adds a an extreme element of danger to it. Well, jumping. Before, yeah. Uh, before we head on too much, like, can you explain like the process of a Fox hunt? Cause I've, I've heard a little bit about it and this was like a, like a blue blood, like English sport, right? I mean, this mm. is like with the Lords and, and the, you know, the Dukes and, and their, their stupid kids all, all did. Well, and, it, uh, it originally fox hunting was truly vermin control mm -hmm. and but they found and it started out that you know all the farmers in the countryside would get together and let their hounds out go kill foxes because those foxes were killing their chickens and then just as the evolution of everything it came over to the united states and and we and, made it into a sport <laughs> <laughs> it turned into a sport, turned into a business, turned into a moneymaker, turned into debauchery, if mm -hmm. you could imagine that. Um, but I think that comes with the, the horse territory, <laughs> debauchery, you know? It does, it does. Because it, it, it uh, takes a kind of a fucked up person to think, hey, that's a, you know, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200-pound animal, 1,500-pound animal. I bet I can ride that sucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just yeah. takes a, takes a little bit of depravity just to to even think that, you know. Yeah, 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 and and, and the way I'm gonna I'll, I'll describe the fox hunting is I'm gonna try to put a positive, the most positive spin I could put on it, and that's with our pack. When we so a typical morning for me when we're getting ready to go fox hunting was get up at four o'clock in the morning, put on all your attire 
then you put your car hearts over it mm-hmm. so you don't get it dirty and um go to the barn wake the hounds up bring the horses in unblanket groom feed um go to the house get a cup of coffee come back and start tacking horses well i i didn't have to tack everybody's horses um because it was just us we didn't have what what's called a field like we didn't have members we were a private pack okay uh, but eventually we did get to get into some some big fields um but yeah typical morning and so we get the horses all ready to go and then we have to we collared all our hounds gps um and then i put my list together what hounds are going out and what numbers um you know i had a a tally sheet or a number sheet for each hound so if number 16 didn't come back to the trailer we know which hound that is and uh, and what kind of hounds are these i was breeding i had crossbreds and and they're a lot of people like to refer to it here. They like to call them walkers. Um, oh, okay. That's kind of your American hound. Mm-hmm. And I had some crossbreds, English. Um, I had some heavy English crossbreds, but I wanted American hounds. And I bred three really good packs of American hounds. And they just suited me and my country. They had great voice, great noses um extreme drive i mean these, these hounds would they they wouldn't give up and so before we go to a fox hunt you know i open up the trailer and then i open up the kennel doors and those hounds and i couldn't believe it that i got them to do this it, the from the first time i saw it to when i was doing it i open up the kennel doors 32 hounds run straight for that horse trailer go inside that horse trailer and I can shut them in and then I load all my horses and off we go to wherever we're going to hunt. And we get there, everybody gets saddled. I'm not saddled, but everybody gets on. I get my hounds, make sure my hounds are ready and I get on, they let the hounds out of the trailer and, and off we go. And, um, the hounds follow me to cover and, I had a way that I took my hounds to cover and my hounds knew that when I slowed down and stopped and stared at the woods, they knew it was time to go. And I would just say, and, and sometimes they found, sometimes they didn't. But I mean, there were times that I was walking down through the swamps, you know, pulling pigs out of the swamps that they had made up. Um, The only thing we didn't chase was deer. Hmm. Um, you know, because there's not many fox left. And so we ran coyote, ran the hell out of coyotes. Uh, oh, I bet. We started killing pigs down in the swamps. And pigs are fun. They'll run. They'll give you a good chase. Oh, uh, I bet. But, you know, I I miss fox hunting in a way because I think the, the, the really last year of um, fox hunting that I did – I, I think it was just one of the, the culminations of a career and I got to be the huntsman for performance trials. And so I basically got to hunt. Uh, I think I took eight of my hounds and there might've been, I think 50 other hounds from six other, seven other packs. And mm. I got to hunt all those hounds together. And that's awesome both days we found a gray fox the first day and the second day we we found a coyote a bunch of people got to view the coyote and and he gave us good sport i mean just wonderful sport but that was a true honor to be picked to hunt all those hounds because you know that's like letting somebody ride your horse (laughs) you're not gonna let him ride your horse (laughs) unless you know them and Mm -hmm. so it was a great privilege and um but now after I started riding again, after the whole broken ankle thing, I realized I needed to get back to, to where I was to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I needed to, to relax. I was getting way too serious. Not that that's a bad thing, but I was just getting up tight Mm -hmm. and I needed, I'm one that's always creating, looking for something new. And so I started, started writing a book. It's still on the shelf, not finished. 
But then I decided I, you know, these traditional bits, um, you know, were never my thing. It just never were. They, I didn't see any reason for them to be. But then I decided, well, I'm getting a little bored with my horses. I want to figure these things out. And, and like I said before, when we talked earlier that, you know, a bit is a bit is a bit, just like a car is a car is a car. It's just mm-hmm. what type. And, and, you know, you, you got a Cutlass Sierra. Anybody can drive one of those. Um, and then you got your Ferraris, you know, mm-hmm. the traditional bits and, and, so there's people that are fine with driving a, their cutlass and, and, you know, never, they're just fine with that. And then there's people that are driving a cutlass that really want to learn how to drive a Ferrari. And mm-hmm. then there's the guys that are driving the Ferraris that are helping those people. But, you know, to me, you know, riding in these bridles and having a horse really performing one is another one of those great feelings. And so, and it improved my horsemanship and it was something, again, it it seems every time I do something in the horse industry, it's something I never thought I would do in my life or in, in the years that I've been working with horses, you know, I, I, I thought it was just, when I started, it was just all about breaking babies. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm first one on their back. I'm first one to do this first one to do that. And I liked it and I just wasn't paying attention to all the other stuff going on around me that I could be doing. And then I just started opening my mind, looking for the opportunities to, to, you know, ride a Grand Prix jumper, ride a, 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 like I told you about that, that cutting horse I rode, um, you know, ride on the polo field and not necessarily be competitive, but stick in, you know, good practice and stuff like that. Um, You know, these are things that I, I did always, you know, every time they happen, I say, I never thought I'd be doing this. And I can honestly say right now, I never thought I'd be doing a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here we are. Sick of, you know, hearing me talk about horses, but you know, that's, this, that's what I do. Um, you no, know, and then it's a, it's a one, uh, I think I, I recorded one new year's day, but like this would be, I would call this like the fish first official podcast of 2023. And, and, you know, and 2022 was just such, like, not so much for me personally, like I had a good year, but like the world got so fucking crazy in 2022 that like, it seemed like I, my focus went from like talking to cowboys to like trying to explain all the crazy fucking shit we got going on in the world. And, and it's exhausting at times too. And I like just talking horses and stuff, you know, like that. I, I really like that. I know a lot of, you know, like I'm an, I'm a, I'm a nerd when it comes to history and politics, like bigger nerd than most people realize. But, um, I, 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 I really just enjoy just, talking cows and horses like there, there's a guy i think I'll, I'll, I'll get try to get you two on the same podcast uh, my buddy matt wilson out of oregon he uh he's a spade bit buckaroo type of guy and he's a houndsman so like i i, th- I think you guys would just hit it off i think you guys would have some some cool stories to tell each other about you know either training horses or training dogs and uh, yeah and you know it just like i love hearing like we didn't use uh we didn't use dogs much, uh, it, you know, where I grew up for, for cattle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we didn't have any fucking trees, so we didn't have any hounds, you know, <laughs> you know, there, there was no need for any hounds over there. And, uh, and so I, I just don't have much, uh, not that I don't have much use. I've never had much use for dogs. I love, love dogs, but, uh, like I've never had much use for working dogs. I just haven't needed them. Yeah, I love, no, I, I know I what you mean. It. And and I see that that's really, I know it was big before, but I guess, you know, with the world of social media, it, it's exploded. And, mm-hmm. you know, same thing. I, I never had any reasons to have a cow dog. I had a, I had a border call in Wyoming that he was great at ripping one's heels. But when it came to listening beyond that, it, I couldn't, 
Yeah. I didn't have time to train a cow dog and the ranch manager's always getting mad at me and telling me to tie that damn dog up. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, so I just said, you know, it just never had a need for those cow dogs. And, yeah. um, you know, and there's nothing worse than having a board of collie that's got nothing to do except run around and tear shit up. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that ain't no joke. Same with blue healers and red healers and all of that. Yeah. And, and um, and hell, I'd say that, you know, your curs and your gifs are a lot more useful than those board of collies. <laughs> a little more versatile. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I just, I, I, you know, since I've, I've never had much use, but I, I love watching a good dog work. Mm -hmm. um uh, and and i i really like listening to to guys that are that know what they're doing and 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 love it you know it just it doesn't matter if it's dogs or horses or whatever but dogs are per, you know kind of particularly fascinating for me because mm -hmm. um you know and, and this is from like early age to like most of my adult life you know we uh once i moved out to nevada I, I got a little more appreciation for a good working dog because guys out here use them a lot because they have to, um, you know, just big, big open country and, <clears throat> and whatnot. But like back home, it was like one out of 50 might be a good working dog. And the rest of them are just in the fucking way. Mm -hmm. You know, they're pushing cattle over the top of you or they're chasing them off the wrong direction or something, you know, and it just, you know, so more often than not, you see a guy with a dog or you unload a dog and you're just like, son of a bitch, it's going to be a day, ain't it? You know, and uh, but then you, you you see one that actually works and, and a guy that knows how to work a dog. And you're just like, holy shit, that that guy and his two dogs did the work of like seven guys. Yeah. And, and, it's, and if, it, it's it, impressive if, to watch. Yeah. And and what what I noticed in that, too, is. And it's the same way I worked with my hounds the same way I work with my horses is quiet. Mm. Um, you don't need to yell. Um, once they pick up on you and understand what you want from them and you've, you've done your work, um, you know, you can let those dogs or let the hounds pretty much do what, what's kind of ingrained into them. And mm. with a little bit of discipline and correction, I mean, I will admit we used rat shot to correct ours when they were running deer. We shot them with rat shot and that was going to be the last time they ran deer. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then I got to the point where there's no more shouting. There's, you know, and I, I used a horn to, to bring my hounds in or to send calls. But, you know, I, I would assume that a good dog man out West houndsman, uh, whatever they you know call them is is probably the same way and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure there's guys that love to yell at them and do uh but to me i don't want to hear that when i'm working cattle i don't want to hear somebody screaming at their dog all the time and no. um i just want to watch that dog work and get and, and get the shit done yeah. um you know but yeah i could i could see talking talking with the man you were talking about um talking horses and talking dogs and the different ways that we worked with them mm -hmm. is you know if you kind of lump it all into one thing there's probably only three elements to the process of training the dogs training the horses but in those three elements you can divide them up a hundred different ways oh yeah and then you got 300 elements Mm -hmm. And, but it's understanding all those intricacies within, I'm just using three as a number. It's understanding yeah. all the intricacies, intricacies in those three elements. Well, and it, it's kind of the same way, even like the different styles of cowboy and too, you know, you've got like the buckaroo, the puncher, and then you kind of got the, the East, uh, you know, East of the Mississippi guys, you know, I guess they're more like cow catchers or something. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, a lot of overlap between all three, <clears throat> but also you can break each one of those down. Cause you got like the California, like vaquero types mm -hmm. as opposed to like the Oregon or Nevada or Idaho buckaroo versus mm -hmm. like the Arizona and the New Mexico punchers a lot different than the Texas puncher. You know, they, they're kind of the same equipment, 
uh, th- through those, but it's still a lot different country where, you know, you're seeing a lot of boar hide stuff in, in, uh, New Mexico and Arizona, um, as, and, you know, in, in West Texas as well, mm-hmm. as opposed, you know, and, and you get into like central Texas and whatnot, and it's a whole different, it's there, you're still punchers, but it's still, you know, it just, and then you move, you further, you move north and you get so more of like the hybrid between the, the punchers and the buckaroo, you guys, guys dallying on rubber uh, and then, and then up into the, the slick horn and, and long rope and stuff. It just, mm-hmm. yeah, there, there's the same elements throughout all of it, but yeah, you can break it down so many different ways. It's, mm-hmm. it's well, it all and, deals with the different country you're in. You're with. Yeah. And, and yeah, the country and, in 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 what you're doing and mm-hmm. of course weather is always a factor in all of that but what i find fascinating is well when i first moved to wyoming and we were at the mint bar i was told do not say you're from texas and i said why and they said well wyoming's don't like texans different cowboys i said well it, it doesn't make any sense um <laughs> But I was young and then said, okay, I won't say I'm from Texas. And um, although there was a ton of people up there playing polo that were from Texas, just don't say it. But now it's it, what's really fun is, is, is taking all those elements and understanding the differences. Like, I want to hear the opinion of a true vaquero. I mm-hmm. want to hear the opinion of a cow catcher. I want to hear the opinion of a, um, a, a, you know, a buckaroo, um, a California. I want to hear, you know, I want to hear the opinions of all these guys because I can take from each of them and apply it to methods that I use. And mm-hmm. to me, that is working on being the best horseman you can be. And, you know, I'm not a cowboy. I, 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 you know, yeah, it's fun roping and and you know chasing cattle, but it's it's the horses. I'm all about the horses, and um, you know, it, it, to me, you can't chase a cow if you don't have a good horse. Mm-hmm. Now you can run past a cow with a bad horse, or you oh, can yeah. rope him, and that son bitch is going to run off. You know, attached to a cow if you're tied on. Um, but if you got a good horse, you got a good horse and you get your job done and, mm-hmm. and, or just enjoy your horse. And to me, that's probably one of the most important things is for, for, I don't care what you do with your horse, but enjoy it. Yeah. And, 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 and just, you know, if you're a trail rider, enjoy riding on the trails, which I can't stand. It's one of the most boring things in the world for me. Um, my, my dad's the same. Like he he loves to just go ride, ah. and 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 I'm fine with. I used to love it, but now like I make my living a horseback. The last thing I want to do on my day off is just go ride, because you know, like if if I'm not riding to do some sort of purpose anymore, like. I I just soon not. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah I understand exactly what you're talking about, and I've tried it. I've tried to go on trail rides, but I end up finding myself schooling my horse. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so I'd rather just pick up another colt. Yeah, <laughs> you know? and that's it. <laughs> or, or I'll 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 veer off from the group because I see something I need to cross or jump or or challenge my horse, and um, you know it's it, it's the another one of the my philosophies is, is every time you put a foot in the stirrup, you are training your horse. And that I learned, you know, I learned, I forgot who I, I think it was an Olympic rider that, that had mentioned that before. And it, it's something that stuck with me for a very, very long time is the minute you put a foot in the stirrup, you are training that horse, no matter what you're doing. If you're standing still out in the pasture, giving a lesson, sitting on your horse, your horse has to stand still or move in a circle so you can keep track of your, you know, your, your student. Um, and so enjoying your horse is, is, is being a better, not necessarily a horseman. You know, a lot of people just have one horse 
And mm. so get to know that one horse the best you can. Um, you know, me, I get bored with one horse. I want different horses all the time because they're different, mm. you know, and, and, and I can always single one of them. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the horses I have in training right now, you know, each one of them has four to five different bridles that I use on them, depending on what I'm doing that day. What I have planned out um, is the bridle that I choose. And if I feel that my horse needs, you know, needs a little more strength building, I'll put him in a lifter bit. Um, if I feel that one needs to be stopping a little more precise, you know, put him put him in a spade or put him in the Barcano and, um, and, and get them to start being a little more precise, but also let you find the holes in them too. Cause mm -hmm. if your horse ain't performing in, in, in the bit you put in its mouth, then you need to go do your homework. Yeah, take a step gotta, back. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And like, like this time of year, I've got a, uh, it's a long shank floating spade with a couple, couple rings on the, on the spoon there that, that uh that's kind of my go-to bit for just about all my horses this year because mm -hmm. it's you know you know short sunlight and uh it's cold and they're kind of cooped up we don't you know not much going outside and they're little chargy little headstrong and they you know they kind of want to fight the bit a little bit so i put a little extra shank on it and mm -hmm. then they got those rollers and it keeps them just occupied enough to where they're not quite as just pushing you know yeah yep and you got the leverage there and and mm -hmm. and you know to really keep them in check and and you can I, still you keep know, a light hand with uh with that extra leverage yes sir yes sir you can and 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 subtle movements too and that's mm -hmm. what i enjoy is 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 riding a horse and having someone say i didn't see you make any moves on that horse how'd you get him to go right left back up and all of that and that's when I know that my horse is becoming a horse, a bridal mm -hmm. horse. But that's also the way I think riding should be. It should look motionless. It, that, that horse should look independent of its rider or that, not to get, you know, sound confusing, or the horse becomes the extension of the person riding them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's something that I preach to my students, you know, all the time is that horse needs to be an extension of your lower body. Mm -hmm. So when you're riding, pretend you're walking. Um, and, and this kind of goes back to riding them like they're made. But, um, you know, and, and let that horse carry itself, a green horse um, or a horse that you're really starting to get into the bridle let them carry themselves even if it's for a split second that that horse carries themselves that second's going to add up to a minute that minute's mm -hmm. going to add up to an hour and you know where i'm going with that it's then it starts to just become them mm -hmm. and so even with my maid horse not i, I don't want to call them maid but even with my horses that are much further along than some of my other ones I still work on their self carriage. I still work on that refinement and the finesse. To me, to finesse a horse is one of the prettiest things that a rider can do. And that might not sound very manly, but you know, it, it's it, it, it's almost like watching. Oh, and I wish I could think of the name, and it just escaped me. But you know, the Spaniards that ride those 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 big um like the frisians and whatnot and they dance yeah. around the poles uh that is just some of the most beautiful horse horsemanship that i've ever seen the way that those horses move and those riders you don't see a muscle move but you mm. know that their muscles are moving a hundred times a second um, yeah. to keep that horse in their carriage. Um, and that, and that's what I, you know, I'm always like, I, I I'm going to go back and tell my students, don't ever, don't ever quit riding your horse. And that yeah. goes back to the minute you put in foot in the stirrup, you're always, you're, you're, you're training them, but never quit riding your horse. And, um, 
I know that might sound also a little confusing too, but that goes back to the, you know, if I'm out in the pasture and I'm, I'm giving a lesson and I'm sitting on a horse while I'm giving that lesson, I've got one leg working on the rib cage. I've got the other leg pushing on the haunches or the mm. shoulder. I'm always doing something and my legs are, are, are constantly flexing and my core my 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 fingers it, it's it's all these little tiny subtle movements that make one big beautiful movement or can make a nice soft subtle movement <clears throat> and to me it's not it's not just here i know i know we like to use the term it's in the hands but to me it's yeah, in the body I, I think so too and you know, on that same, same level, like, uh, kind of like, you know, going back to like the dressage where like they're, they're so aware of where their feet are all the time. And, yes. uh, I, that's what I love about a, a feedlot is cause you, they have to be aware of their feet all the time. You're opening and closing gates all the time. You're sorting in the alley and, and some like, you know, the really high bred cutting horses, don't work out so well in the feedlot a lot of times because they're just too hot. You know, they, they just want to cut, cut, cut. And and that's fine. It's a lot of fun. I, I really like just, you know, going in, pulling one out, and then just letting them go to work as, you, as you're pushing them to the gate. Mm -hmm. But there's times in the alley where you just need them to step over a half step and let one by so then you can then you immediately swing the ass end around and let four by. Yeah. You know, because because you got one that's holding up the bunch and you've got about, you know, five, ten that that can come by. But it's just this one. And so you just go a quick in and then you can go, you know, then you just and it's just a just a little little precise movement on your horse will do the trick. But if your horse ain't working, you know, you've got to figure out how to communicate that to them. Mm -hmm. And and they just they you have to make them aware of their feet and. uh yeah, and so like wh whether it's you know you got your gates that come together in a V and you you know you open one, close it, and then you shift them around and, and you try not to kick. You know, just little little subtle movement with your leg will do the do the trick if uh, if they if you're listening to them and they're listening to you. It's uh it's pretty cool, especially on a young horse. And then yeah, you know I think a lot of guys get in trouble on on young horses is like. And, and, you know, I, I know some guys are making big circles, so they don't have a choice. But when you have a choice, like, quit on a good note. Go get a different horse. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It, it, that, sometimes that does more good for them than any any other training. You know, just like, hey, we, we learned something today. Let's call that good. Yeah. And and and, and that's like the, that ride I had on the buckskin the other day. I was like, I just want to keep riding you. I just want to keep riding you. But I know your limits and mm -hmm. I don't want to push you um, because you're absolutely perfect today for where you were at in your training. And, you know, it's those times it's, you know, I was working Big Pete the other day and I just was having such a nice school on him. I wanted to keep riding him, but mm -hmm. I'd been on him an hour and, and I was like, you've done everything I've asked. You've done more. So, you know what? We'll take you back to the barn. And I drop the reins on their neck and they know the way home. Yep. And, um, you know, I've got a happy horse at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, and that, that's good. I mean, like you, you do kind of have to treat them like people. And then, you know, that's where you, you get, you don't want to treat them too much like people. Cause then you get into that, that horsey person world and, mm -hmm. uh, the, the horse Karens as we call them around ah, here, but not the horse Karens. Oh man. <laughs> and you're just like, there, there's a point where like you have to kind of treat them like people, especially if you're, if you're making a living on them, you like you, you have to treat them like you're like any other, you're, um, you kind of have to treat them like your best pickup that also breathes and shits and pisses and, you know, and, and gets sick from time to time and pulls muscles. Mm -hmm. like you, you have to treat them like a, like a high dollar piece of equipment. Cause they kind of are, they just also have to have a heartbeat <laughs> and, and a uh, brain. <laughs> yeah and so like when when you have a real good horse sometimes you gotta like 
maybe give them a couple of days off because you know you got a couple of real real heavy days of work coming up and you need your your best mount so you know instead of <laughs> instead of just like saddling your good horse to go do something quick go saddle a colt mm -hmm. or something that needs a little more work and uh, and do the easy stuff on that one so that maybe further down the road when when you need to you know neighbor calls you to come rope a bull you can go pick that one instead of your you know the one that's getting kind of aging out by then you know yeah yeah and you've put some time on the young horse mm -hmm. and um you know i i i know a lot of people their school of thought on days off on horses is get on their back give them a day off well <laughs> but i i think you know it goes back to the breaking babies and turning them out for the winter um, and they always come back in the spring as if they learned something out in the pasture by themselves. And um, I, 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 I'm a true believer that time off for a horse is good. Um, and I know there's the old, you know, school of thought that time off, a horse learns with time off. I don't know how they're going to learn, but I just think it's a maturity thing. It, 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 it it allows that horse to grow and mature into themselves a little bit because a horse has to develop a lot. I mean, yeah. not just the brain, but you know, joints, legs, knees, mm -hmm. confirmation, basically they've got to develop all of that. And the more they come into their confirmation and I think a good confirmation, the better they feel when they go out, when they're ridden correctly, they're not hurting. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's hard not to humanize a horse sometimes, but sometimes you just have to in order to get a point across. And there will be a lot of times that I will put a human emotion onto a horse because it helps me kind of think a little bit until I figure it out. And, and I think one of the biggest things that I will always and, and, and this might not just be a human or hu human thought, but is, is, is compromising with a horse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there comes a point where the horse just isn't going to do what you're asking to do because either it can't or fighting him is not doing any good. So you find a way to make a compromise with that horse. And there's a million different ways different scenarios, anything like that you can, you, you can come up with, but you know, if, if I'm trying to get my horse into water and my idea is to get all four legs in the water, belly deep, and he will not do it. If he puts a toe in that water, we made a compromise. Call I'm happy with it because tomorrow he's going to put two toes in that water. Mm -hmm. And if I'm lucky, he's just going to go in. But well, I didn't it's, fight it's, him. It's setting realistic expectations too. Yes. Yes. Yep. Exactly. And then, yeah. I and you know there that's a uh, what you you know far better than I do riding horses for the public. Um, the realistic expectations are few and far between. Like yeah. er, everybody thinks they've got uh, the next you know secretariat or, or you know the next uh, you know you know. Uh, uh, you know, name any of the cutting horses, name any of the roping horses. Everybody thinks they've got the next one. Mm -hmm. You know, they got the next Doc Bar just sitting there that they rescued from a you know a kill pin. He's fifteen the top years cat. old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that. I I was drawing a blank on 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 the cat. I highbrow cat. That was who I was who I was uh, searching for. But metallic cat. Yeah. Um. But everybody thinks they got the next one of them, and uh, most of the time they don't. They just got a horse, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they, they they they've got a horse, and usually one that's um, it's not too late to do anything for them. But for those people, you, you they don't got enough money for me to make them what the, what they want them to be. Yeah, and and you know there's and and that's like I was saying earlier in our conversation this afternoon is that that's why I liked working with trainers. You put 30 days on one and they're happy as long as they're going mm -hmm. forward, stopping, turning, 
not bucking, that trainer could finish him out. But then you get your 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 horse Karens or your backyarders, and they got some common great ass quarter horse that is like he looks like three horses put into one and they think it's a great horse but it's mm. their horse and nine times out of ten that turns out to be a good horse for them and yeah. you know i've had i've had some really you know bred out the wazoo horses come through they were absolute pukes i mean yeah. just pukes and then i've had some some of the most common I mean, I don't care if thoroughbred, quarter horse, warm blood, just common as hell, turn out to just be lovely animals. Mm. And I can recall one that came in and I didn't think much of him. He's like 14 hands and just kind of common. Mm. And I think five weeks on him, well, three weeks. I was roping other horses off of him and this is just, I just saddle broke him. And so I was working other horses off of him. And then I decided, well, you know what? I'll, I, I'm going to go stick and ball a little bit. They just, they just, you know, picked up the hay and the fields are flat. Let's go chase the ball around a little bit. And this horse was phenomenal for me. Um, you know, just going out there and, and, and letting me hit, you know, neck shots, uh, near side, off side, you know, both front, back, tail shot, belly shot. Horse didn't care. And he would rate himself just beautiful. You know, if, if I was coming to a short ball and I needed to check him a little bit, he was like that. And just the most common thing. And the lady, you know, when she came and got him, he had like a 12 hour trip to get home because of some. I don't know what was going on and he was perfect. She had to unload him on the highway and he was great. And, um, but I will say he lived a full life. He passed away a couple months ago. And, um, but you know, just because the horse is bred, if their papers are a mile long, doesn't mean they're going to be a good horse. No, uh, no. I mean, because, well, I, I always used to use the, the example of Paris Hilton, like, can you, can you name one thing that that gal was good for? Like, like what she contributed to society, actually? Like, I can't think <laughs> of much. Not a damn thing. But her granddad was a hotel tycoon, billionaire. Yeah. Yep. I mean, she, she's got the same bloodline. She well, more the Kardashians, shit. same thing. Uh, they, they at least make money. Paris Hilton, like, she, no. didn't even make a, she didn't even make a good porn. You know? <laughs> <laughs> With her big feet. <laughs> Laziest blowjob ever. <laughs> oh, you made me snort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, like, I mean, the bloodlines tell you what they're supposed to do. Yeah. But that, but it's, 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 it's also kind of like a suggestion, like, most of those horses have the ability, but I don't know. It also takes the the right person to. Some some of them are a lot more trainable. Some yeah, of them are. They and, and and that's the one thing is that there are horses out there that are so trainable, and those are the ones. And it's like I said earlier, the ones you want to keep green, because they're so fun to train. And I think in the past four years or so I've had a bunch of those come through that I, I just couldn't get enough of them. Mm. And like my buckskin horse, he's as, I mean, he's goofier than shit. I mean, the horse will take every feed bucket off the fence. He'll drag blankets out in the middle of the pasture. But when you get on him and you go to school him, it is just like, it's an amazing feeling training this horse um, because I know where he came from as a two-year-old. I had him as a two-year-old and you could barely trot him in a straight line. And now I've got him, you know, doing bridal work now. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, it's the coolest thing. Like 
I don't want to finish him because I just want to keep training him. But I know yeah. that as long as I have him, I'll always be training him. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's those big steps that start to get smaller and smaller and start to become just, you don't even have to think when you ride that horse. Yeah. And that's where I sometimes kind of, kind of miss the Bronx, you know, mm-hmm. miss the Buckers a little bit. And, there was, uh, uh, you know, there was this one horse I, I rode for, I rode him for 60 days. He had, uh, let's see, I guess he had, he had had 15 or 30 rides on him as a two year old. Uh, he's a big dapple gray, uh, appendix quarter horse, uh, you know, Hancock and, and, and some real fast th- thoroughbred, I guess. Um, and, and I, so they, they sent him to me as a, as a three-year-old cause they didn't have time to, to keep going with him. And they said, well, he, he might buck cause you know, he's a three-year-old, but he, he's, he got started just, you know, a couple of rides on him, whatever. And, and he, he bucked one time in, in the little, uh, just a little water pin there at the feed lot. And then, uh, within a week I had, I was loading fat, uh, well, not fats, but pregnant heifers, um, on, on the truck with him and like side passing, like swinging the big heavy tub gate behind me. And, uh, sent, you know, that, that's a cool video you get to send to the owners. Yeah. And, uh, and next thing you know, like, uh, within, within 60 days, I was doctoring cattle outside on him. And, uh, and he was just so much fun. Like, and, and he was like, you know, Nevada Cowboys dream, just big hippie leggy sucker, you know, could really step out and cover some country and, uh, and just smart, quiet, easy going. And, uh, but like when, when you needed uh, to blow to one, he was there. I mean, he, he would, he would give it to you and yeah. then just, just work a rope. I mean, just, just the kind you like. And then, 60 days came real fast, you know, <laughs> like it came real fast. I was like, man, I hate to see that sucker go. He, yeah. he was kind of becoming my, like my number two guy. And, uh, and then you're like, well, shit, but I, I they still send me pictures of him. So I know, I, did, <laughs> yeah. I know I did a good job on him. That, that, that's when you want a baker's dozen of those type, you sell 12 and you keep one. Yeah. That, and you that retire. Was, he was so cool. <laughs> like, uh, and I, I've never been a huge appendix, uh, quarter horse fan. I like, I've just never, never really got along with thoroughbreds too much, but man, I got along with that dude. He was, he was cool. Well, I think the appendix horse gives you, in my opinion, what I enjoy is the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, not, not to say that a thoroughbred is more athletic than a quarter horse, but it's just two different abilities. And when you put Mm -hmm. those two together, it, it creates something unique to the appendix horse well Um, and those those long-legged suckers man they're they're a lot better to sit at a long trot than them short squatty quarter horses you know mm -hmm. mm-hmm oh we got um uh oh it was a number of years ago we got two horses two appendix horses from mom and we brought them up here and one of them was just we called him gentle Ben because he was just gentle. He was just this big gentle horse named Ben. Um, and you, I mean, if you had to jump in through fire, he'd do it just because you asked him to, and he thought it was the best thing for you and an amazing animal, um, an amazing inventor. And then we got another one from mom, another appendix quarter horse, or I mean, gelding, and this guy was when we first started jumping him he was a puke i mean this thing he would go up to a cross rail and just freak out and by the end of his career he was competing at i believe the three star level which is just four stars as high as you can go in three day and this horse was just eating it up he was winning everything and um he did it right up until he you know couldn't anymore and i think he was 13 14 years old Hmm. um you know and and and, but he gave us the the quarter horse mind with that thoroughbred athleticism yeah and you know i thought that was kind of cool and um 
you know, I like thoroughbreds. I like quarter horses. And, but I used to love thoroughbreds and like quarter horses. And now I'm back into really loving quarter horses and liking my thoroughbreds. You know, it's, it's always changing for me, Um, Hmm. you know, or evolving because my horsemanship's evolving. Yeah. Uh, So, I mean, I mean, they don't typically breed the thoroughbred for their, for their mind so much. They just, they would kind of want them to run. You're right. And, uh, and, you know, it's kind of like the Holstein, you know, like they, they bred all the maternal, maternal instinct out of the, the Holstein cow. And, you know, they just, they want milk. That's it. They, that, that cow doesn't have to take care of a, a baby at all. Uh, so that, they don't they don't care about the maternal instinct, but they you know they just want that milk, and uh, and it's kind of like the thoroughbreds. You know they 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 want them to run. They want them to run fast. That's that's about it. And uh, yeah. the quarter horse is so it's so versatile because you know you got the you got you know, like the the halter class, which is there. You know you just want them muscled up. That's like your mm-hmm. bodybuilders. And then you got the rainers, the cutters, the ropers, you know, the, and then you got the, you know, the, the, the racing quarter horses, which is, you know, where the quarter horse came from to start with. And mm-hmm. it just, it's, it's, it's really wild how like, there's like seven or eight different breeds within the quarter horse breed. Oh, you, you know, I never thought about that, Matt. Um, yeah, because you're, you're, you're not going to breed a halter horse like you're going to breed a cutting horse Mm -mm. and you're not going to, well, I mean, there's going to be a variation from the cutting horse. Well, yeah, you're not going to train a cutting horse like you would a rainer and you're not probably going to train a roper like you would a rainer. Um, Mm. But what's neat is if you can combine a little bit of each one of those abilities into one horse. Yeah. I mean, you'd have a, rock star of a horse and, and then and, especially if you put a laney wilson butt on him then you got bo <laughs> jackson in a quarter in a quarter horse form <laughs> <laughs> yes sir you're right <laughs> <laughs> yeah i you know and i, I uh my, my wife's uh she grew up around um around morgan horses and i kind of like them a little bit and you know and then the the draft crosses always are, are pretty popular from time to time you know they the draft cross goes in in phases, you know. People really love them, and then then they kind of fade out of out of you know they kind of go out of style, and then mm-hmm. then they spark back up. And but you know it's just there's not many people that use draft horses anymore. So those like when you get a good draft cross, they're kind of cool uh, anymore, just because they're 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 almost kind of rare. And then they they get not so rare, and they do you know like they kind of fade off. But then they're they're always around. Yeah. There's always somebody that 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 wants a draft horse. Yeah, I mean, hell, Ike Sankey's selling for one hundred fifty thousand dollars, so yeah, <laughs> somebody <Yeah>. wants him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's wild, you know. That, you know, they they always say that the cowboy they've they've said it since I they probably said it back in the old fifteen hundreds. You know, when the when the Spaniards were punching cows uh, in in California and in Texas. You know, they 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 said the cowboy's a dying breed, but. Man, as long as uh, as long as there's cows around, like there's gonna somebody's gonna need a guy on a horse to go catch one, <laughs> and yeah. so there's there, there's always gonna be a cowboy. People, yeah. for what it for however technology moves along, people like horses, and I don't think you're gonna change that shit. No, and and, and I I agree with you 100 percent on that, and and you know there there's gonna be the guys that want to evolve to four wheelers and you know catch jeeps and things like that and but you know to go out there on a horse and run one down and rope them Mm -hmm. you know it's to me that's that's a little bit of a dying breed and it's not so much i don't know why i don't have kids and and so i i i can't speak much to kids these days um you know, but I, there's so, there's so many other opportunities for, for, for kids these days that, you know, cowboy is just not that exciting to them unless they grow up knee deep in cowboy culture. And that's mom, dad, job, everything. Mm. Um, 
that sure helps. But you know, and and people talk a lot of shit on on this this Yellowstone show, and like for good reason. There's 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 plenty of stuff that's not accurate, kind of portrays us not so well. But one thing it's done is it made cowboy cool again. It's like people, you know, these these younger guys, like they they're not they're not looking down on cowboy, and they're like, hey, those guys are pretty badass, you know. And uh, it's something about it, like it takes a, you know, you, you say you're not a cowboy, but I, I, I disagree. You got, you got some cowboy and you, you've, uh, you've done your share of cowboy and you've moved on to, to different, different things, but like, well, thank you. You, you can't not call yourself a cowboy. It's, uh, it's in, it's in your blood. And then you don't, you get in a little bit of trouble because there, it's not necessarily you have to be born into it. There, there's plenty of stories throughout time of guys that come from New York City that turned out to be top hands. You know, like there that that's happened more times than 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 I could count mm-hmm. um, throughout history. So like, you don't necessarily have to be born into it, but you got you got to be able to see it for um, it, whether it's romanticized or not. You know, like however you get into it, like. It, it's got to be people got to see it and, and the right, the right type of people will, will migrate to it. And sometimes yeah. they're the wrong type of people, the yeah. wrong type of people will migrate to it, but they guess what? They don't last very long. They don't, they, it, 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 as soon as it becomes work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean like the, the, the wild crazy ass shit that, that that's always there. But even more so is the work. The work is always fucking there. There's never there's never a shortage of work. No, there's and, not. Uh, yeah. So like if if you if you if you think you want a cowboy, go cowboy, and pretty quick you'll find out how bad you actually want to do it. Yeah, and then you'll go work at a dude ranch. You find it's much easier. Yeah, well, and, and you, you know you get tips and you get pretty gals every now and then too. So I mean, free drinks. Yeah, m- maybe maybe you'll have a Laney Wilson come through every now and then, huh? <laughs> um, I I don't want to keep you too late, but I gotta I gotta pee real bad. But let's uh we'll end this for the main episode. If you got another fifteen twenty minutes, we'll uh we'll do a bonus episode for my Patreon subscribers. And, yeah, absolutely. Man, I, I'm. I'm sure enjoying this. Uh, where where can everybody find you before we before we uh, take a little little break? Um, I I you know I'm not big on Instagram. I don't do TikTok, but Facebook is about. It, it's just I guess I I, it's my MySpace to me. It's all I do is Facebook and and um, I know you can only get so many friends and stuff on there, but you know, I can always kick people off, but Facebook's about the easiest place to find me in YouTube. I've got some stuff on YouTube. Nice. You uh, know, just t- Tommy gazelle. Yeah. You punch in Tommy gazelle and I'll come up and then some guy that does karate. Hell yeah. There you go. Well, can you kick that guy's ass or what? I doubt it. Well, maybe we should get him on, on here and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll uh, set up a fight. We can do that. <laughs> well, Tommy, this has been a hell of a lot of fun. We'll, uh, everybody who's a Patreon subscriber will be back for, we'll, we'll, we'll talk some wrecks when we come back, but, uh, okay. Um, yeah. And everybody else, you should go sign up on Patreon, patreon.com slash burning daylight. But man, Tommy Gazelle, this has been a fun conversation. We're going to have to do this again. Absolutely. Yes, sir. All right. Well, uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in and, uh, move your ass. We're burning daylight. <laughs> You rise up in the morning Beneath the stars so bright Pull your hat down Make sure your cinch is tight Horse is kind of snuffy Cold chill up your spine We'll get your ass Moving sun will burn only light Is J-
just a gather and you won't catch them all. But when you ride through the gate, make sure you sit up tall. I can see the horizon, it's looking pretty bright. We'll get your ass moving, sun, we're burning daylight. 